Okay, thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, uh, you'll have to slightly bear with me. I'm a chief executive, so the idea of holding a microphone, pressing a button, and speaking at the same time is quite a difficult concept for me to deal with. But hopefully, you will uh, you will stand, stay with me while I while I do that. It's a it's a great privilege to be here. A great honour to be. Um, uh, invited to speak to you today. I spent yesterday at the Heart Centre um, uh, in Aswan, which is a remarkable um, uh, foundation, a remarkable organisation. Um, not just a building, but more importantly, the people who work within it. I have, I, I travel to countries all over looking at healthcare systems, looking at healthcare institutions, and you will struggle to find better, a better group of people, dedicated researchers and uh, um, uh, medical and nursing people than you would find in your local hospital. A fantastic uh, asset for you and a great jewel, I think, for the, for, the, for the population. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of visiting that. Thank you for speaking to you today. And also, can I, can I thank you on behalf of the National Health Service? And can I say, I'm, I was the Chief Executive of the National Health Service in England not the whole of uh, the United, United Kingdom. There are different ways of uh, running healthcare broadly on the same principles, but slightly differently in different parts of the, uh, of the United Kingdom. But I'm, I'm responsible for England. Um, but a great privilege to be here and, and to thank you on behalf of the Na National Health Service, because although we are called the National Health Service, um, we are an international health service. We recruit and work with people from all over the world and there are many, many Egyptian doctors and uh, physicians within the NHS who provide fantastic care for our patients over many, many years. Indeed, I was reflecting that the very first consultant uh, I appointed after being appointed as a chief executive was a gentleman called Claude Chicani, who came from uh, e e Egypt, who provided a fantastic service. He was an A&E uh, consultant. Um, for the people of South Yorkshire for many years until he recently, recently retired. So a great uh, a relationship with Egypt, both in terms of the countries, but more importantly for the NHS, for the people who come to work in our system over many years. So thank you very much for, for all of that. What I want to talk about today is to tell you really a story of the development of a healthcare, of a healthcare system. I won't take you through all of the history of it, I want to pick out some particular, what I regard as important parts of healthcare and the experience that we've had in, in our country, some of the lessons that we've learned that hopefully um, uh, you may uh, think they're interesting lessons and perhaps there are things within that that may help you in, de in developing your healthcare system. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to, I'm going to cover uh, a bit about the history, a bit about the funding of healthcare, a bit about the principles on which healthcare is delivered, uh, a little bit about when you spend money, making, making sure that you get the right outcomes for patients, and we all know it's very easy to spend money in healthcare and not get the right outcomes for, uh, for, our, for, our, for our patients. Talk about the importance of people, about investing in people and getting the right people uh, available, and to talk a bit about the role of government and how you create the right environment in a country for healthcare to, to flourish. And the very first thing that I would say, in a sense it's a health warning um, about this. I, as I said, I've travelled uh, uh, to lots of countries and the conclusion I've drawn is that the kinds of problems that healthcare systems are facing all over the world are very similar. The degree to which they're facing them are significantly different, but the basic problems are the same. So that, in a sense, is helpful in terms of learning, because we can all learn from each other in those circumstances. Since the bad news is that no one has solved them all. So there is no healthcare system, and beware of people who tell you that there is a healthcare system over here that if only you implemented your own country, it would solve all of your problems. It simply is not the case. Healthcare inevitably 
grows out of the experience, the knowledge, the understanding of the people of a particular community and a particular country. You have a whole series of cultural, historical experiences and personal experiences which may be very different to those in other parts of the, of the world. And things that people try and do in some countries simply do not work in, in, in others. All I think we can do in these circumstances is to share practice, to share our experiences and to learn the particular things, to pick those things out of particular healthcare systems which resonate, which are important uh, to you in your own in your own, own, own country. And I will draw out, I think, some broad learning from our experience, but it really is for you to think about what it is about the experience of, uh, of, the, of the health service in my country that may or may not be applicable to your, to your own. And I want to start here. Um, this um, uh, is a, uh, a photograph. It's a photograph of London um, after the Second World War. Um, it's, uh, as you can see, it's the St. John, St. Paul's Cathedral in the, uh, in the middle of it, and you can see the desolation around it. And all I would say uh, uh, to you in those circumstances, it was at this particular moment in our history that our government decided that we should have a universal health care system. People will say to you, you can't deliver universal health care until all the circumstances are right, until the economy is growing, until you've got the right number of people, that you've got the right investment, etc., etc. Simply not the case. In our circumstances, we, we took the view at this particular moment in time to build a health care system. We had our cities were ravaged by bombing, tens of thousands of soldiers and civilians were dead, the economy was on the brink of bankruptcy, and there was bread rationing uh, in, in our community. In fact, there was, there was rationing for most stable parts of our, of our diet. And our politicians at the time had the vision, the understanding, the commitment to create a universal healthcare system at this particular moment in our history which was remarkable. This was the main architect of our healthcare system. No society can legitimately call itself civilised if a sick person is denied medical aid because of a lack of means. This was the basic principle on which we were, we, were, we were established. And what the government decided to do was to use healthcare to rebuild the nation. And that's a really, I think, a really important thing to say healthcare is like almost nothing else that we, we do. We require to do it uh, collectively, we depend on the expertise and the compassion of our fellow citizens. Most of the resources that we need uh, to deliver healthcare are within our local communities um, them, themselves. So the idea of using healthcare and the development of a universal healthcare system to build a community, to build, rebuild a nation. Places like Rwanda are using this enormously powerfully to rebuild their society. It was used in our circumstances to create and build that really, really important um, uh, thing. And the other thing that I would say is that the strap line for the development of our healthcare system was not a healthier future for our people. It wasn't, uh, we need to be more healthy. The strap line was in place of fear. Because lack of care, lack of access to healthcare system creates fear in our communities. If you're worried that becoming ill creates bankruptcy, creates problems for your, the economics of your family, it destroys your family, destroys things around you, you behave very differently in the way you operate in society. So the creation of a healthcare system which provided uh, services free of the point of use was critically important for rebuilding the confidence of our people. In a sense, in place of the fear that they had in the past of what would happen if they became ill. So they could focus their attention on rebuilding their lives, rebuilding their 
uh, communities and rebuilding their economies. Now the healthcare system that we developed at that time, the National Health Service, um, has uh, developed hugely over the last uh, 60 or 70 years. We currently have a budget of 117 billion pounds. It was rather a daunting thing. Uh, every year I used to get a, a letter from the Treasury that said here's 100 billion pounds. Um, I obviously used it very wisely. Uh, but that's extremely a large amount of, uh, of resource by any stretch of the imagi imagination. Um, uh, we have a large number of hospitals um, uh, in our country, particularly I think we have a large number of large hospitals. Um, if you compare it with most other countries, um, uh, the kind of average size of a hospital is about a thousand beds, so it's a big, they're big institutions. Um, and we, and we organise our primary care, which is the absolute centre of our healthcare, healthcare system around general practice. Um, these are small or getting increasingly larger groups of general practitioners who come together, who are funded on a capitation basis, who provide services for a defined pop population. And they have a huge amount of independence, they're independent organisations, and I'll talk a little bit about the way you incentivise uh, doctors in particular in, in the future, but there are nearly 8,000 of those practices around the country. And there are 1.4 million people working in the, in the, in the NHS. Um, one of the great joys of my job, as I used to do, is I could go nowhere without bumping into a whole lot of people who worked for the NHS and who genuinely believed they could do it better than I did. Um, so that's the, the, the fundamental, and the, the other issue I think, Built on what uh, Magdy said er earlier, um, an understanding now, for years the view was that healthcare expenditure was a, a drain on the public purse. That somehow um, a whole set of people over here whose job was to raise money, and there was a whole set of people over there whose job it was to spend it. And the healthcare was in the spending bit. I think increasingly over the last 10 years, it's been clear that health expenditure has an enormous benefit for the economy. This was um, part of the, our government's growth strategy, a central part of the government's growth strategy was uh, developed here called Innovation Health and Wealth, which set out how we could use health expenditure, and there is some fantastic research being uh, published in the medical journals in particular and others around the multiplier effect of health expenditure on the economy as a, as a whole. Um, and importantly, the role in which a proper functioning healthcare system can have in delivering both um, economic growth through things like reducing absenteeism from work. If you think in my own country, for example, the biggest two reasons for absenteeism from health are de clinical depression and musculoskeletal problems. There are things that we can do about both of those things significantly to improve uh, absenteeism at, at work. Um, but also, our relationship with the life science industry, um, clinical trials, the way in which all of these things boost investment in the economy as a whole and help create a more vibrant, innovative, and dynamic economy are critically important, and I guess our RS as relevant in Egypt as they are in, in, my own, in my own country. Now, although we have had many changes over the last uh, 60 years in healthcare in our, in our country, and one of the things that I would say is that um, uh, there has been a tendency over many years to tinker with the system all the time, we're constantly, health reform never begins and never ends, it is a constant. There are people constantly thinking of new and clever ways of organising healthcare. And we've had more than our fair share of, uh, of changes in, in, that, in that matter. Some of them um, are, uh, originating in sensible and evidence-based thinking. Some of them completely the political whims 
of the government of the day. Nevertheless, underpinning all of that, the critical thing about any healthcare system is the principles on which it is based. And these are four that, we, that we've held to very tightly <coughs> excuse me, over the last 60 or 70 years. Indeed, um, uh, our healthcare system still, and heavens above have we got uh, problems in our healthcare system like any healthcare system in the, in, in, in the world, um, still has huge, huge public support um, uh, for these principles and this way of, of, of operating. So our healthcare system is universally available, it's available to everybody in our, in our society. Um, uh, in fact, our view is that, and some people have difficulty connecting with it, we have a particular responsibility in those circumstances to help them connect if they have if they've got a problem with it, so very important that. It's free at the point of, uh, free at the point of use. Um, uh, uh, we have a relatively small co-payments on prescriptions and so on, optical and dental, but the broad uh, area of healthcare is free at the uh, at the point of point of use, based on clinical need, based on an analysis and an assessment of the health needs of the pop population, and is funded through general taxation. The argument for us for general taxation is it's fairer, it's the fairest way of doing it. Um, but also it is the most efficient administratively to do it. Our administrative costs are absolutely tiny compared with most healthcare systems in, in the world. And those principles have been around for, you know, since the beginning of our, of our, of our healthcare system. Now, if you think about um, a reform, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll particularly talk about uh, reform over the last 10 years or so, 10 or 12 years or so, um, there are a couple of things, there are three phases to the health reform that I want to talk about, but I just want to specify a couple of things. When the Blair government came into post in, in, in 1997, they launched a huge amount of change as far as the NHS is con, uh, NHS concerned. There are two things I particularly identify here that are worth mentioning. And the first one is this whole idea of cash for change. If you think of most healthcare systems, and I think the Egyptian is no, no different, um, uh, over the next few years, more money will be going into the, uh, into the Egyptian healthcare system. How much will be a political uh, decision at the end of the day, or be a judgment made by uh, uh, leaders in this country, or, or whatever, but nevertheless, healthcare expenditure is growing all over the world, and I guess Egypt is just, is just the same. The big issue is to make sure that that money goes into the right place to get the right outcomes for our, for, our, for our patients. And one of the things that the government, our government particularly were focusing on, for example, is they identified three priorities, coronary heart disease, um, cancer, and um, uh, mental health, and invested huge amounts of targeted money in those areas to see direct outcome and improvements for patients, and rigorously approached it through that, that, that time to make sure the money was spent where we thought it was going to be, was going to be spent. And the second thing I would identify uh, in relation to this part of our reform was the whole way in which you pay your medical staff. Now, um, it's an interesting thing. When I go uh, to different countries uh, to talk to governments about the way in which they are uh, uh, delivering reform into healthcare, um, you, you come across relatively late on in their considerations issues around people. It's ironic, really, in lots of ways. Many governments, their first response to we need to create a new healthcare system is to go to McKinsey or PwC or one of the big firms and say, help us do it. And they will create for you a very fancy um, uh, payment system, uh, financial system that underpins healthcare. Um, my view, generally speaking, is that many of these have already failed in other parts of the world, but nevertheless, your governments, no doubt, governments will pay huge amounts of money to these people to do it. And then somewhere down the line, someone says, what about the people? 
And in a sense, you don't need me to tell you how important the people are to the delivery of healthcare. Sometimes, though, when people talk about health reform, you wouldn't think they existed. They were kind of essentially autom automatons in a in a in a a system. So, getting the way in which you pay your people and the way you organise that will have a bigger effect on healthcare delivery in your country. My experience is that many of the clever payment systems that people will talk about. If you pay your doctors poorly, they will find other ways of bringing their income up to a level that they think is appropriate. And you lose control then of where the incentives in the, in the system operate. If you incentivize only volume, if you only incentivize the number of things that people do, as opposed to the kinds of things that they do, you will get a healthcare system which delivers lots and lots of widgets, lots of things, but doesn't improve the healthcare of your population. You need to think very carefully about the way you do that. Now, sometimes we've done this well, sometimes we've not done it well at, well, well at all. But fundamentally, underneath all of this for us, is we pay our specialist hospital staff a salary. Um, they get a, a, they have to provide so many sessions a, a week to provide to, to get a salary. On top of that, you get special payments for uh, expertise, uh, peer-driven payments, and national payments. And general practice, we incentivise both in terms of capitation, but also on something called the quality and outcomes framework, which has been reformed some time, but actually tries to connect payments to doctors with the things that we know make a difference to patients and the health of the, of the, po of the population. And if governments spent more time thinking about this and less the time thinking about McKinsey, we'd all be better, in my opinion. Secondly, we had a process of design. And one of the things about healthcare systems is how do you design them? And this is a key, key part of government. So I'll come on to this government in a, in a while. How do you design it? <coughs> Designing it around quality is really the kind of gold standard that we need to think about. And we started to work on how could we make quality the organising principle of our healthcare system? How could we make the institutions, the incentives, the payment systems, the uh, buildings, the training, all connected to improving quality? Now, you may think that's obvious, and it is obvious, but actually, you can count on the fingers of one hand how many healthcare systems have been developed and designed with that in mind. So an important part of any healthcare de uh, delivery system is the basis on which you might uh, organise it. And finally, this whole issue about the role of government. And it's very, I have, I've worked for five Secretary of State of Health, three Prime Ministers, and I don't underestimate the difficulty and complexity of being a, in a politician in any kind of uh, circumstances. It's very difficult job to do. And in lots of ways, um, uh, particularly, um, I think there are some ex-Ministers of Health there, um, a health minister, um, you don't become a health minister necessarily to, to gain popularity around your, your society. Generally speaking, health ministers are not always the most popular. Not because they're not well-intentioned or because they're not motivated or whatever, but there are difficult decisions relating to health. That, that uh, uh, It's very difficult, I think, to make everyone happy in those circumstances. But nevertheless, it's important that government does what it does really well, well, and doesn't try and do things that it doesn't do well. The conclusion I've drawn from, uh, and this is based on the research done by Julio Frank in particular in Mexico and, and others, is that the power and strength of government is in stewardship and design. It's in creating the system, designing it, making sure it works properly, and then making sure you make the changes when it doesn't work properly. Governments um, are not good at managing hospitals. Governments are not good at managing on a day-to-day -day basis healthcare delivery. 
this is the this is the role of clinicians and managers at a local level, close to their communities, close to their clinical and, and other staff. This is where it works. So when government gets involved directly in managing hospitals, I've all, I've only seen bad things in, in happen. And sometimes government doesn't like getting involved in design, but it's vitally important that they that they that they do. So the NHS facing problems, it's facing financial problems, it's facing demographic problems, it's facing a massive explosion of long-term conditions. My guess is these are things that you would understand well, um, and it is suffering from a shortage of, uh, of, of, of workforce. Indeed, if you look at the greatest threat to health delivery over uh, around the world, it's a shortage of qualified, experienced healthcare professionals. To make it happen, and the NHS is no different. We still have those, uh, we still have those problems. We're trying to solve them in all sorts of different ways, and no doubt you are, you 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 are too. But it's vital that we do it to create a sustainable healthcare system uh, uh, for it. We're doing we're doing six things. There may be other things that you 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 need to do. Um, we think that the future of any healthcare system. Um, needs to be focused and organised around uh, what we've described as patient and people power. If you think about uh, the massive uh, 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 tension in the healthcare system on the development of things like uh, diabetes in your in your in, in your country, it's a massive wave of health need complications coming down the line uh, uh, for you. If you've got type two diabetes. The most important thing is the way in which you control and look after your own health care. The interventions can do so much, but actually it's the people themselves. So how do you create an environment where people have got the power, they've got the information, they've got the technology to enable them to, have to control and help their own health care systems? The role of primary care in this is going to be absolutely uh, uh, vital. We've had I think a, a difficult uh, a few years in terms of investment in health in primary care. The government now are focusing their attention on investing more in primary care. And if you think about those kinds of um, tensions and pressures on healthcare, we've got a very aging, rapidly aging population. We have massive long-term long-term condition issues. Primary care is going to be at the forefront of making that right to create a sustainable healthcare system. We know that the further, the more complications people have, the more expensive it is, the worse their outcomes are. So getting upstream in terms of prevention uh, is going to be critical to making it happen. Um, there are some other issues around there that may not necessarily be applicable. But finally, I just want to say something about this whole issue about quality, and about quality and outcomes. One of the things about um, healthcare quality and getting the best outcomes for your patients is, um, in the jargon, quality is systemic. And by that, what I mean is that as great as the heart surgeon is, or that any kind of surgeon is, um, uh, they can be fantastic, they can do the greatest thing, they can run the greatest heart centre in the world but they won't get the best outcomes for their patients unless the whole system operates together. So you need a government who understands the importance of design and stewardship. You need a population that understands what the risk factors are for, for particular conditions, about how they can live their lives to avoid ill health. You need a population that understands the first signs and symptoms of particular problems that they might that they, that, that, that they, they might have. You need a primary care system which can pick them up as quickly as possible and have access to diagnosis to ensure that uh, they get the right care as fast as possible. You need hospitals, you need multidisciplinary teams who can sit and work with individual patients and create 
uh, plans for them when they need them. You need fantastically skilled clinical teams, surgeons, doctors, radiologists, cardiologists who can work together to create great outcomes for patients. You need patient hotels, you need aftercare, you need support in the community services. If you can do all of that, you can create the best outcomes for patients. And the challenge, I think, for all healthcare systems, and my guess is the challenge for you in this country as well, is how you make that whole system work for you in the environment and the culture and the history that you, you have. Our people, the people of Egypt, deserve nothing less. Thank you.